Hello, my name is Ryan, and today I want to talk to you about custom schema directives. Um, so a little bit about me, uh, that's my name, and I'm a JavaScript consultant. Uh, so I do a lot of uh, application builds for companies. I've got a few clients who are startups and do kind of full stack uh, application builds. So I'm using a lot of uh, Angular. I focused on that quite a bit. Lots of Node and lots of GraphQL. Um, Google developer expert. And I do a lot of teaching as well. Uh, this is my main spot where I do that, so teaching on Angular in particular at angularcast.io. So one question for the room um, that I've always been curious about whenever I do these things is um, whether most of us are consumers of GraphQL or creators of GraphQL APIs, I should say. So if you are mainly a consumer of GraphQL APIs, maybe put your hand up. Okay, and if you're also a creator of a GraphQL API, so that's awesome. There's lots of us who are actually creating the servers, creating the APIs. So I think for you, hopefully this talk will be uh, quite valuable. So let's get into it now. What is a schema directive exactly? Well, we could look at the GraphQL spec and we could see that it says that schema directives are kind of this way to provide um, an alternate kind of uh, runtime execution uh, for resolving something out of GraphQL. So you might have a schema that is set to resolve something in a certain way, and you might, be, you might write a directive so that you can affect the behavior of that resolution at runtime. Um, so from the spec, we get clues as to what these look like. Now, there's very minimal um, kind of advice on directives within the spec. Um, there's two that it says query should have, skip and include. And the way that it kind of works, this is the uh, example from uh, GraphQL, uh, the GraphQL website. Um, if you use the include directive, you can have some kind of Boolean condition. And if you're making a query, if that condition is false, for example, here, um, with friends is false on this query, it's not going to return the list of friends. If it were true, then that list would be included. Uh, it also talks about uh, schema directives. So that, those were for queries. On the schema side, it talks about this one directive called deprecated. So a way that you can mark a certain field as being deprecated, no longer in use. Maybe you provide a message that somebody who's making a query for that field should use uh, a, another field instead. So what do they look like exactly, these schema directives? Well, let's say we had a field. A uh, field is foo type string. The directive is simply this, the at sign and then the directive name. If you have arguments that are going to go into the directive, though, that would look like this. You'd have your parentheses, argument name, and then you can pass an argument as such. Now, uh, we can take a look at, a, at an example like this. Maybe we can riff on that deprecated scenario. Uh, let's say we've got this invoice type, we've got this client name field, and we want to deprecate that. We want to start using a different field name for whatever reason for that same piece of data. Well, what we can do is we can use a deprecated um, custom schema directive to give back a message. So instead of just immediately breaking anybody who's trying to use that field, we can instead send them back a message telling them to use another field instead. So here's what, would, here's what it would look like if that field were queried for. So what the consumer can then do is get that message and say, OK, I've got to update my queries. And then they query for the correct field. So that's um, kind of a clear example. You know, Mark something is deprecated. But let's think about what else we can do with custom schema directives. And um, really, I mean, the possibilities are endless. We can use them to effectively change the behavior of how something re resolves at runtime. So it's useful for stuff like this, internationalization, for example. So if we had some way of knowing in our query what language the consumer wanted to go for, we could maybe have our base language, our, our default language, maybe it's English, uh, but we could provide alternate results in our queries based on what kind of language the user wanted. This is one that I really like, authentication and access control. So we have this way of being able to mark our schemas with certain um, rules for what the user needs to have in terms of access level before they can get to certain fields. We've got things like string formatting. So again, we can just replace whatever comes back uh, from our resolvers, meaning you can format a string. So maybe you're storing a number just as a number, but you want to format it as a currency on the way back, that sort of thing. Um, caching, which I won't get into too much. I don't know if it's a super good use case for caching, but, but it is possible. Um, and then also async work, because um, resolvers are asynchronous to handle async calls. So we can do th interesting things like maybe use a custom schema directive to make a REST API call and then serve that data back. And we'll see uh, about that in a little bit. All right, so 
Implementing these used to be really painful, it used to really suck. Um, I did a talk back in 2017 at GraphQL Summit, uh, the link is there if you're interested. It was about authentication and authorization in particular, and part of it was about how you can use schema directives to achieve this. And at the time, the tools weren't in a good place to, to do this, and the code necessary to, to achieve this was verbose, it was huge, um, it just wasn't really easy. Um, thankfully now, with some newer tools from Apollo, it actually is quite easy, quite a bit more approachable than it used to be. All right, so let's go for a visit to the schema. And so what does that mean exactly? Well, with Apollo, we get this class called Schema Directed Visitor. Um, so this is what you would use if you wanted to create a, the, if you wanted to write the behavior for your custom directive. What you would do is you would override some of its methods. And the two that would probably be used most often, I would suspect, would be these two, visit field definition and visit object. So these talk about the points in your schema that you want to affect, essentially. Uh, field definition, you know, you want to visit the field level to override behavior there. There's a whole bunch of other ones. You can affect anything within your GraphQL schema, uh, scalars, unions, enums, everything, but probably the two at the top you would see most often. All right, so let's see an example here. Let's uh, maybe keep it really simple to see how this behavior, writing this behavior would work. Let's say we had this data here. This is like the initial response we would get from our GraphQL server. But what we wanted to get was something like this. Hello, GraphQL Day Toronto. So here's a pretty simple server. We've got our query type. It's got one field, hello, sends back a string, and then just a simple resolver, sending back the string uh, very easily. What we would do to uh, maybe replace that message with something else would be something like this. We'd first have to define our directive. So that happens here. Um, we want to put uh, the directive key word there, and then we have to name the directive. In this case, we're going to name it replace. Um, and then we want to talk about any arguments that it might take. In this case, one argument, the replacement, a string that we would pass in. Um, and then we have to say where it works. Um, so there's a bunch of different spots, again, in our schema that a directive could have an effect. We've got to be, um, we've got to be, we've got to tell our directive where it can operate. On this case, it's on the field definition level. So then here's where the magic kind of happens. This is where you would modify the behavior. So this is that implementation of that class I was talking about, schema directive visitor and um, you extend it. And then for any of the places where you might want to modify the behavior of those resolvers, you override the methods. We're going to override visit field definition in this case. And the magic kind of happens here. You provide a custom resolver. So field.resolve is going to be something that is going to take over the resolution of that field. Uh, we can get arguments. Remember, we're going to pass in an argument in this case and we're passing in that argument on replacement. We can get that from this.args, and in this case, we're just going to pass that through, essentially. <clears throat> so we target the specific field definition we want. We get the arguments out on this.args, and we just resolve with that replacement. The next thing we do is we've got to tell, uh, <coughs> we've got to tell our server about it. So if you're, if you're using Apollo, um, and you're using make, exec make executable schema, you provide it with a list of schema directives. You, essentially, you register them. All right, so after all that is done, a little bit of work, but after all that's done, we can just put this directive anywhere we want to, anywhere that it is allowed to operate on anyway. So we can put it on our hello field here. And remember, our resolver is going to still be this kind of base case, right? This base case of just giving back hello world. But since we have that directive in place now, Every time we make a query for it, it's going to respond with our replacement. So a very simple example, but it shows kind of the potential of how you could affect the behavior at runtime. You can do, you know, you can operate on various conditions that might be present on your server, and you can respond how you want to. So directives can be async, which is cool. Um, here's a use case that I don't know if it's a good idea to use, but it shows that you can do it. You know, let's say we had a user type and we could query for a list of users. Um, what we can do is create something like a REST directive. So in this REST directive, we might make a call over to some API, get some data, and then resolve with that data. And in our users list here, 
we could say, let's make a get request. And again, I'm defining which uh, arguments this um, custom directive should take. In this case, I want a specific method, and then I also want a URL to go to. So the method here is going to be get. I want to make a get request. And I can make a get request to GitHub's user's API. Probably not a good idea, because they have a pretty good GraphQL API. So you wouldn't maybe want to do this with GitHub, but you could do it somewhere else. Um, so this custom directive is going to be responsible for fetching some data and then returning that data to the user. So this one's a bit different because there's not really like a base case kind of behavior that you would start with that you're then overriding with this directive. You're kind of relying on this directive to handle the logic at all. But it's going to go make that call. And this implementation is probably not a good one. There's, you know, this is the happy path only, really. There's going to be lots of edge cases that you'd have to deal with, but shows the potential for directives. OK, so then the one that I really like using context for authorization. So um, what we can do is, you know, there's, there's various ways you can handle authorization within your GraphQL API. Um, and there are various different levels that you might stick authorization onto. So you might have like a catch-all authorization spot that says the user has to be authenticated in some fashion to begin with. Uh, but then they might need to have certain permissions to get to certain uh, other pieces of data within your API. So how do we handle that? Well, one way is we could have something that looks for permissions within the user's authorization information. So if you're using something like um, JSON Web Tokens, perhaps, if you're doing some kind of uh, OAuth or OIDC authentication, you could be looking for something like a scope, some kind, of, um, some kind of tag, really, that says the user has permission to get to a certain piece of data. And what's really cool about using custom schema directives for this is we can start to mark off specific fields within our schema that have certain permissions rules. Uh, so for our users list that uses this REST directive, we could also say this uh, user making this query has to have the read users scope. And if they don't, they don't get to, uh, to get at those users. This also shows how we can start to stack our directives. You can have one after the other after the other, and they're going to go down in sequence. All right, so this is one potential implementation of that has scope directive. Uh, you get the context, which is going to you know, have information about the request that comes in. And one piece of information on there, hopefully, is going to be the authorization header that the user would be sending from the client. So you'd get the authorization header. You'd uh, expect it to be a token. If it's not found, you error out. Um, and if it is there, you might send it to some function that handles looking into the token, uh, checking the payload and looking for a scope, and looking for the particular scope that we want them to have. Remember, we're saying in this directive here that the user has to be able to read users. That's, that's the permission level that's required. So we get that. Um, uh, we, we are going to get that from our arguments, whatever scope we want them to have. We pass that through to a function that's going to check their scope, make sure they have it, and then uh, you know, say not authorized if they're not authorized, but if they're good to go, we just resolve uh, as we normally would. Okay, so those are some cool things we can do, but to get to this kind of behavior, schema directives, they're not the only way that we can uh, affect the behavior of our APIs. Uh, we've got things like middleware. Middleware is another option. There's a package called GraphQL middleware uh, that is effective at doing such a thing. Um, here's an example of what the permissions scenario might look like with a middleware. You'd, um, you'd start to build up a schema and apply a certain middleware, the is logged in kind of middleware here. It's doing similar things. It's looking for the, uh, the authorization token. Uh, it's checking scopes, and then it's going to uh, build up a middleware that finally goes into this, what we're calling this protected schema down at the end when we start up our server. Um, and, you know, this... This way of doing it with middleware and some kind of newer ways that I'm seeing these days, they're, they're kind of touching on this emerging, I think, preference for not really doing too much in the schema. So if you pay attention to sort of stuff going on in the GraphQL news lately, there's this, um, there's this feeling that uh, schema-first development isn't maybe the best way to go. Maybe code first is, is a better way. And this is an article uh, by the people at Prisma, which I'd recommend reading. And it touches on some problems that come along with a schema-first approach. Uh, 
So if you're writing your schema first, you've got to do things like keep your schema and your resolvers in sync all the time. So you might write your schema, and then you've got to go and update your resolvers. Makes sense, but they can get out of sync easily. Um, modular, modularization becomes an issue. Uh, developer experience, because when we're creating a schema, it's like this big string, essentially. So developer tools have to keep up to be able to help us to work effectively with them. Um, so lots of reasons that the schema-first approach can be a challenging one. And so what they propose is that a code-first server approach might be the, the better option. So you'd write, you'd kind of write your, your schemas, your server side, I should say, in a way that is resolver first, and then maybe generate what's necessary for the schema from that. Um, and you know, we're talking about JavaScript here, really, no, in a node environment. It's, um, it's kind of common, I think, with a lot of other environments to write the code for your server first before having your schema in place. So um, there's, I think we're going to see a lot of shifts to that. So all that to say, you know, if you've got uh, a schema-first approach and it's working well, uh, and you can see a use case for custom schema directives, then have at it. But um, you know, if you're sensing the need to shift away from that to a code-first approach, then maybe custom schema directives don't make a ton of sense. They can be useful for some things, but maybe not for everything. Um, so that's all I've got on custom schema directives. One thing that I just wanted to maybe show you, just to plug um, before I go, is this new site that I created, which is a tutorial to uh, take you through uh, kind of hello world to making various queries with uh, GraphQL, and it's called Try GraphQL. So I'll pop this open here and just show it to you. So it's uh, this interactive tutorial where you're going to go through, read uh, about how to do various queries, and you can complete various challenges. And if you get it right, you go to the next lesson, etc. So, um, I mean, most of us here probably it wouldn't benefit, uh, maybe it would benefit you, I don't know, maybe not totally because it's very hello world in nature, but if you uh, have any colleagues, any friends who are wanting to get into GraphQL, and if they're not, uh, if they're looking for a place to, to kind of get started, uh, maybe send them over here. It's trygql.com. So that is um, hopefully going to be a good place to learn GraphQL. And then the very final thing that I'll say is I just got back from San Francisco where I was uh, doing some video interviews with some of the leaders in the GraphQL community. Um, and it's for uh, a site I'm putting together, which is to showcase uh, companies that have been um, putting GraphQL into production and how they're going about it, the benefits they're seeing. And the idea is to build up a set of uh, a case studies that people can look at if they're thinking about implementing GraphQL themselves. So maybe if you're at a company that's a little bit on the fence, maybe not sure of the benefits, maybe not sure if it's a good idea, um, this should be coming up pretty soon. There'll be a bunch more that I'll be posting as well, but these are the five people I interviewed uh, just this week in San Francisco, and hopefully it'll be a good resource for you and for your company. Uh, aside from that, the slides are here, uh, bit.ly slash custom schema directives. And uh, thank you very much.